Uh, I was going to say, you got dogs? <laughs> yeah, I've got three dogs, you know, and it's my, raining outside, so they're, they got to be indoors, you know. So. <laughs> my, my cat barks, so that, that, that's the problem I have. Yeah, you need to, you need to take your cat to a psychiatrist. <laughs> Is that a catatonic? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, no. do, 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 do. <laughs> oh my God, that should have been on the program. It is. It, <laughs> no, it, it will be now. Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory. And Clint Necro. Brought to you by Public Safety and Education and the Trigger Pressers Union. And now, your hosts. Hello, everyone. This is Clint Macro, and this is my esteemed colleague, Matt Mallory. Meet the Pressers is a safe place for trigger pressers to gather in fellowship and talk about guns, gear, gadgets, training, and political activism. And today, we have a very unique guest. Matt, why don't you uh, tell everyone about your guest today? No problem, Clint. So we have Admiralis Jr. He uh, faithfully served our country in the United States Marines, went on to be an FBI agent, and was in the 1986 Miami shootout. This episode is brought to you by Mountain Man Medical. The right medical training and gear should be accessible to every American. Mantis. Mantis X helps shooters suck less. Meet the Pressers is sponsored by Next Level Training, Saber Red, Cutting Edge Bullets, the USCCA, ASP, Common Sense Self-Defense, and T1 Ammunition. Meet the Pressers is also generously supported by other fine companies, ranges, and our Patreon members. Thank you. Thank you, uh, guys, for asking me to be on. It's, uh, it's a pleasure, a great pleasure. Thank you. So tell, tell us a little bit about uh, your background, anything that I missed that you can uh, delve into a little bit more, and, and what led up to the, uh, the training and, and such in the shootout. Well, uh, my life is pretty simple. I grew up in South Texas, um, you know, home, at home, church, uh, family, you know, God, country, the whole, the whole, uh, the old standard. I don't know what the new standard is, but the old standard was God, country, and uh, church, you know, Amen. and um, had, a, had a good family. Um, the Vietnam War was going on uh, in the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s. Um, so uh, I was destined to be drafted. So uh, I preempted that and I joined the Marine Corps. Took off when I was 18 uh, from South Texas, uh, went to uh, MCRD California, and never went back home. You know, uh, since I was 18, I, I, I've only been home to visit. You know, so uh, was lucky enough, I mean, tremendously blessed uh, to have met an FBI agent who, um, who mentored me. And um, he, he, it was his suggestion that I, that I apply to the FBI. Otherwise, I wouldn't oh, have known wow. anything about the application process. And um, as luck would have it, I guess luck and, and a good background, <laughs> um, I, I got selected to, to join the FBI in uh, 1979. And then your book, the, the name of your book? Uh, the name of the book is uh, FBI Miami Firefight, uh, Five Minutes to Change the Bureau. Some of our younger viewers might not know the backstory of that. Would you be willing to tell the uh, set up the stage for, oh, for that incident uh, that changed absolutely. the way the FBI does its business? Absolutely, and I'll try to try to make it as short as possible. You know, it's a complicated story. In uh, the late summer of 1985, we started having a, a series of armored truck and, and bank robberies by two unknown individuals. Uh, you know, Miami, Florida being Miami, Florida, there's bank robberies every single day. But this group was different in that um, they used smoke grenades to, to whenever they escaped from the scene, which was even by Miami standards kind of odd, you know, so, and they um, wore, they were camouflaged, uh, you know, from head to toe, uh, sometimes camouflaged, sometimes just black clothing, like SWAT, SWAT members, assault weapons. And uh, they started out kind of kind of stupidly, uh, like they were amateurs. But as the case progressed over uh, a nine-month period, they became more and more proficient and more and more violent uh, in, in their um, in their attempts and 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 their robberies. And uh, it became our, our our squad's priority. And uh, the investigation led to um, a car stop on April 11th. Uh, 
1986 that resulted in a massive gunfight between eight FBI agents and two uh, heavily armed bank robbers. At the end of the day, out of those 10 participants, eight agents, two bank robbers, at the end of the day, uh, nine out of the 10 participants were wounded. And uh, out of those nine that were wounded, four ended up uh, dying, two FBI agents and the two bank robbers. Um, three, uh, five of us were wounded, uh, five agents were wounded, um, three of us seriously, I, I, including myself, I was seriously injured. And I've been credited with ending the gunfight. You know, I, I guess <laughs> I hate to, I hate to, you know, shed light on myself. You know, I normally try to stay in the background, but um, I, I ended up being one of the last agents standing at, at the at the end of the gunfight. You know, and, and I, I'm credited with ending it. You know, but uh, it was really a team effort all the mm -hmm. way. And I give uh, Ben Grogan and Jerry Dove, the two agents who died that day, I give them all the credit. You know, they they did not take one step backwards. You know, when they were faced with danger, they they, they stood, you know, and, and and faced danger head on, you know, and, and they made the ultimate sacrifice. It's an amazing story. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? Unfortunately, uh, 34 years later, people have forgotten it. Even even the law enforcement community um, has forgotten it. And, and, and sadly, even within the FBI, I, I keep getting asked to come back to, to speak to, to new agents classes. And uh, it's amazing how, um, well, I mean, life is life, you know, people get older, mm -hmm. new generations come up, you know, but uh, the newer generations, you know, sometimes, you know, forget the, some of the important history. Sure. The new, we, newer generations are getting it from Call of Duty, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> right. We, we've got a, we've got a, new, a new generation that's going to vote in this next election that didn't know life pre-9-11. So, yeah. It's, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's scary sometimes. You go, well, I, I'm sure every, <laughs> every generation is, has been scared by the next one coming up probably since the beginning of time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey guys, this is Dave Jenkins with Rochester Personal Defense, and you're watching Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Macro. Meet the Pressers. The end of the name of your book is how it changed the... Uh... Right, uh, five minutes that changed the Bureau, right, and, and it really changed the Bureau. Actually, it changed all of law enforcement. Um, yeah. the, the, the biggest um, contribution, I guess, or the biggest uh, glaring uh, problem was uh, weapons. Not not the functioning of weapons, but the the types of weapons. The uh, the bad guys, uh, the robbers, had an assault rifle, and we had uh, six shot revolvers. And mm -hmm. uh, the assault rifle carried uh, thirty round uh, thirty round magazines. You know, so if uh, if I'm shooting, if you and I are in a competition, and I have to reload every six shots, and you you can you don't have to reload except every thirty shots. Who has the advantage? Okay, the the, the guy the guy with the, the high capacity magazines, and then secondly, the assault rifle was extremely I mean four or five times more powerful than a handgun. I mean it's it's just incredible the the, the devastating firepower and, and velocity. It was specifically a two, three, what specifically two, what caliber. kind of okay they were so AR-15s right it was a, a mini 14 but it was a it was chambered in two two three you know M16 ammo you know so. and was it full auto. No, thank God for that. It was semi-auto, and, and, and a lot of uh, reenactments <laughs> they, they show they show the shooter as a full auto weapon, you know. But that wasn't the case. It just sounded like full auto. My God, he he had nice trigger control. <laughs> so, being uh, being law enforcement myself, I, I'm kind of on that that side where I teach civilians and I'm also law enforcement and teach law enforcement. And one of the things that I I try to uh, this discern between assault rifle and uh, AR, which what AR stands for is Armalite rifle, uh, right. is that unless it's full auto, I don't like to call it an assault rifle. Mm -hmm. So if it's, it, in New York State, they call it an assault weapon. Right. But usually if it's, you press the trigger once and multiple rounds come out, then I, I would contest that that could be considered an assault rifle. No, but that, if it's that, one that's press of the I mean, trigger, that, then it would be Still, but not that, not taking away that, but no, just no, because the politicians are using that in a way to try to strip people from their Second Amendment. Correct. So Correct. Really trying yeah, to delineate know. between the assault right, rifle. You know. Well, I, I, I would suppose anyone leveling anything at you <laughs> is an assault weapon at that point in time. How about that? Well, I'll tell you what, though. No, it, it, looked, it looked like an assault. You know, we didn't know it wasn't a full <laughs> auto assault weapon until after, way sure. after the fact, you know, so. But, you know, continuing on the changes, uh, the... Uh, 
the assault, the uh, the Mini-14 high-capacity uh, rifle and the revolvers, uh, obviously the revolvers were at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So um, that changed uh, in law enforcement. Uh, they started looking at the high-capacity pistols, you know, the, uh, the you know, 10 round, you know, 14 round, 15 round, uh, you know, Glocks and, and Smith and Wessons and SIGs and so on. So that changed. Uh, the other thing that changed was, um, uh, the especially within the FBI, I can't I can't speak to other agencies, but the FBI authorized uh, the purchase of um, uh, HK MP5s. Mm -hmm. they, they purchased um, enough MP5s so that every two agents could have one, you know, per pair, and um, they Cruise, purchased. Cruiser ready. Yeah, exactly. And then they purchased. Uh, enough shotguns that every pair of agents had a, a shotgun. In other words, you could, if you were a, a team, a couple, riding in a car, a patrol car, you, one of you could have a shotgun and one of you could have an MP5. You know, so that upped the, uh, the firepower. And of course, the high capacity magazine uh, pistols that were, that were uh, subsequently uh, selected and, and issued. And then the other part of it, which a lot of people don't really talk about, is uh well up until that point um it was a psychological side you know there's a physical side of survival mm -hmm. guns tactics body armor cars and, and the physical side but then there's a psychological side one of these individuals uh, the uh, the individual known as platt p-l-a-t-t -T, platt uh he was shot to pieces okay and people kept saying well you know he should have stopped you know, in the middle of the gunfight, because he took a hit through uh, his right arm that severed his brachial artery, mm -hmm. penetrated the side of his chest and, and hit him in the lung, the right lung, and continued center ma into the center mass part of his body towards his heart. Unfortunately, the round stopped uh, just about an inch short of the heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, and everybody kept telling, keeps insisting that that's a non-survivable hit. Okay, it probably was, but you know that, I mean, that that's kind of like, you know, voodoo magic, you know, was it survivable, not, not survivable. Right. Right. Eventually you're going to die from it if you don't get medical care. Right. But I was told that even if he had gotten to a hospital at that point, he was going to die anyway. So, I mean, you know, that's a 50, 50 bet there. And I'm not sure which side I would go on because he didn't, he didn't die. He kept fighting. Mm -hmm. He fought for an additional two or three minutes after he received that injury. And he went on, to kill two FBI agents after after he received that injury, so there's the psych the psychological side. You know why why do some people keep going and other people just stop? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you you hear stories of people get shot in the arm and they and they quit. You know, so there's a psychological side that law enforcement has taken into account now. Mm -hmm. You know, over the last thirty years, the psych psychological training. You know, in this, hey, just because you're shot doesn't mean you're going to die. Yeah, just because you're shot doesn't mean that you should stop fighting to, to save your own life, you know? So, um, and that's, we've come a long way in, in that respect. Uh, in, in Mindset is a, is a huge yeah, exactly. component of training. And, and we've had uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman on, on the show and, yeah. you know, in his yeah. books, he talks about several instances where, yeah. you know, law enforcement officers or military personnel were like really bad, but they still fought yeah. through that yeah. and, and survived. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, if you, if you even want to look at just how bodies work, how many people have shot a deer in the heart and they still had to track the deer three miles through the woods exactly. because it just kept going and going. Exactly. Now, my people aren't deer, but I mean, I've read a lot in the last, I mean, I, I made it my life's work doing the research. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've done a lot of research in police shootings, you know, and it is amazing how much punishment a human body can take and still keep functioning. If, if the person mentally wants to keep functioning. As, as you said before, mindset. If you have the mindset that, hey, I can survive, I can fight through this and win, then you know, there's a high probability that you, that you can. But on, on the flip side, I, I went to a lecture by Charlie Plum. I think he's deceased now. Uh, he was in uh, Vietnam uh, POW. Charlie Plum had a, had a saying uh, that caught my ear. If you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, what? I, it, it took me like a while to figure that out. So if you, think, you know, if you think you can do something, you prob you're probably correct. 
But if you think you can't do something, you, you've lost a battle. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you've yeah. just set yourself for a loss. Yeah. You know, that's n negativity. You it's know, all about and, mindset. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I always, I'll always tell my students that, uh, you know, it relates it like a vehicle. If, if uh, you get a leak in your radiator, the vehicle doesn't just stop working immediately. Right. All the fluid's got to leak out. Friction's got to build up. The engine yeah. seizes. And even yeah. then, you put it in neutral and it can still push it. And yeah, exactly. putting it in neutral and pushing it, you know, that's yeah. that mindset. That's the adrenaline. That's somebody on drugs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. That's a now, you know, we don't, we don't, <laughs> we don't want, I don't think any one of us wants to have our radiators, you know, emptied, but, <laughs> yeah. but that's a very, very good analogy there. Excellent. Hi, I'm Michael Cramp. I'm with Century Martial Arts. This is Meet the Pressers with Clint Macro and Matt Mallory. Meet the Pressers. Being that you were in Miami in the 80s in the FBI, did you have to wear a white linen suit? Oh, you know what, though? It was <laughs> funny you say that. Everybody, it's so funny. Every law enforcement officer down there tried to emulate Miami Vice. It was hilarious. Yeah, really? It was, it was hilarious. I mean, you know what? I, and I, I, even I'm guilty of it. You know, I, I, uh, it was so hot down there. We used to wear sports coats with, uh, with uh, polo shirts underneath. You know, instead of the old uh, shirt and tie, you know, the yep. old button down shirt and, and the mm -hmm. tie, because you know, it, it's really hot, you know, I'm a human. It's not so much the heat, it's the humidity. But uh, so I started wearing all the pastel, you know, polo shirts, you know, real <laughs> cool guy with my blue blue blazer, you know. So, I mean, I, I was just as guilty as everybody else. You know? <laughs> That's awesome. We got to find a photo of him like that. And put oh, that my up. God. I, w I wish I had taken some photos, you know. Luckily, I, there's no photographic evidence. <laughs> <laughs> just hearsay. <laughs> so and, I, I, and I'm saying it. You know? <laughs> I find it interesting when you look back at history, like lessons learned by one, uh, you know, one military, one organization, one agency, it doesn't always make it to other agencies. And, mm. and you know, a lot of the lessons you're saying that the FBI learned on that day, if you look at like LAPD with the, with the uh, North Hollywood bank shootout, they relearned those lessons on that see, day. And that was in the 90s. The, that, is, that is a very good point because I watched that shooting when it happened on TV, you know, because we had um, we, we had a, an area, a, a, a technical support area that uh, like our techs, our, our computer techs and stuff, you know, they had a, a CNN going on all the time. I, I, I don't watch CNN anymore. But back in the in the day, CNN was the only sure. the only uh, news network. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually saw the uh, the shooting unfold. And I was like, Oh, my God, I, I said, haven't they learned anything? And that was that was what like ten years ten ten years later the shootout happened. Yeah, probably the, uh, close LA, to that. Yeah. Yeah, the LA shooting happened ten years later, and I, I was just appalled, thinking how can they how can they not have learned from our experiences? Okay, but then I you know I as I've gone through life you know and, and done research, it's not so much that cops don't learn the lessons; it's the politicians. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know. The cops know what they need. I mean, who's, who, who, who better to, to tell you what equipment they need than the guy who's doing the job or, or the woman who's doing the job? Okay. And, and, and I started finding out that the issuing of these weapons, you know, uh, uh, high capacity rifles and, and shotguns and, and, and uh, MP5s and stuff, it's a, it's a political decision. Yep. Okay. More than a, than a lack of, uh, of judgment on the cops part. Okay. And uh, I, I, because I, after the shooting, I, I, I've lectured, and, and I still lecture to, to some departments. I was amazed at that the, the departments had learned the lessons, but it was either because of a, a, a political uh, bias, uh, you know, uh, saying, hey, you know, our, our cops don't need uh, high-capacity uh, weapons or uh, automatic weapons, or it was a budget issue. Okay, so, I mean, you, you, have, to, you have to be honest, you know, it was either po political or budgetary. You know, but it still it still hurt though. I mean, but LA LA should have a should have had a super budget. They just uh, let me put it this way: anti gun. When, yeah, you know when 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 cops have to go to a sporting goods store to beg uh, the, the 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 manager to lend them you know <laughs> lend them M14s or M16s yeah. to, to fight to fight a couple of bandits. I mean, that's a sad day. Definitely, you know, especially in Los Angeles. If well, you were out in, in in you know Timbuktu, Kansas. Okay, I could, well, no, in Timbuktu, Kansas, you'd have hunting rifles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you what, though, but politically speaking, back in that point in time in, in California, it wasn't, 
I mean, compared to now, it wasn't anti-gun at all. I mean, you could go right. buy an AR, you could go buy an AK. Hence, they went yeah. to the local sporting goods shop and they right. unloaded his racks of guns. Actually, I yeah. understand that guy never got his property back, and that's what. Oh my God! Yeah, Man. that's. But it was yeah. it was right after that event was the catalyst to start a lot of the the dominoes to fall with the anti-gun mindset in the legislature, right. In California. Right. So yeah. it's, it's interesting to see how everything has a uh, has a cause and effect, right? Exactly. You know, but talking about the, the gun owner, you know, it just goes, you know, just uh, validates the old saying, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. You know, she <laughs> lost his property, you know, but you know what though, uh, it, it, it's, it's just, it's just sometimes it's maddening uh, how politicians can really truly screw the pooch, you yeah. know, when it comes to, to law enforcement. You know, I, it's my understanding, my son's a deputy sheriff in the county that, that, that we live in, you know, he's been been a deputy sheriff for almost 10 years. Um, law enforcement officers are, are almost petrified of having to really confront anybody. It's not so much that they can't, but they're worried about being backed up by their politicians, by, by the system. You know, called the Ferguson I mean, effect. Ex exactly. That was it. That was it. Exactly. You know, and and it, the the FBI did a study, and I don't know whether how how uh, official it was, but I heard FBI friends of mine tell me that yeah, it's, that's what they called it, the Ferguson effect, and um, it had a real serious impact on, on um, law enforcement. I mean, I, I, I heard people saying, hey, listen, you know, uh, there's a, something going on up the road. I'm just going to back my car up, turn around and walk away. You know, it's like, why? I don't need the hassle. You know, and, and that is just so shameful on politicians, you know, that, you know, and I've always wondered, the public has, has, uh, has a uh, high mind and goals when it comes to, hey, we need to keep our law enforcement officers accountable. But nobody ever, ever, yes. ever holds a citizen accountable. Yeah. Okay. A citizen, by all means, we all have rights. Mm. Okay. But people, people stop at that point. Okay. And I, I, I look at my, I talked to my liberal friends yesterday. Yeah, people have rights, but people also have responsibility, you know, where does the responsibility part of it come in? You know, you, you expect the, uh, the police officer to follow the law, but yet when it comes time to defending himself, you get all wishy-washy about, well, they should have de-escalated. They should have picked another option. Dude, you're not on the street. You know, you're not the one who, who's, whose life is on the line, you know. Yep. A citizen yeah. should be held responsible. That, you know, they have rights but they also have responsibility, you know? Well, I, I think the biggest problem is that politicians hold law enforcement and law-abiding citizens to the standard of the criminal. So when a criminal does something wrong, then they, they punish everyone in, in respect by limiting and restricting the rights and liberties of all citizens. And first and foremost, law enforcement military are citizens first. Yeah, And exactly. that trickles down. You know, we were talking in a, in a conversation earlier, when you don't have your badge on you, you're a citizen, you know, and, exactly. and you know, uh, when these politicians pass these laws, especially where you are now in Virginia, oh, yeah. that is because <laughs> a very small amount of criminals have done things. And quite frankly, a lot of times when you look at the instances and in specific cases that are the catalyst for those kind of knee jerk reactions, those mm -hmm. criminals should not have been on the street to begin with. It's exactly. the failing of the politicians and the government that these people are out there doing the crime that they're doing. In New York, we've got a, a, a really unique situation with bail reform. The governor's basically reformed the bail, and, and, and though we believe in you know, innocent until proven guilty, they, they, they took the other aspect of it and like, okay, somebody's a repeat offender, but you know, we're not going to let them, we're just going to give them an ROR release on your own recognizance. Here you go, go home and, you know, don't commit another crime and go see the judge. And that's not how it's turning out. I mean, these people are repeat offenders. There's people actually uh, criminals that are using it to their advantage where now they're going and just committing another crime back to back, back to back, have no right. intentions on going into court, which makes it even more troublesome and more, more of a danger for law enforcement because now those law enforcement have to go out and serve a warrant. To, to bring that person in to their day in court. Correct, correct. You know what, I, I heard that, and uh, it's not, not, not just in New York, it's uh, a lot of other states, uh, California comes to mind. Mm -hmm. it's the, uh, what a ludicrous policy. I mean, what a, a, you know, it's, it's the politicians who pass these edicts, you know, all of a sudden, hey, you know, the, there's this alleged pandemic going on, it's the end of the world. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the law, you know, uh, because I, I have emergency powers, you know, yeah. but they need to be held responsible. Uh, and of course you can't because there, there are some laws, you know, like Congress, 
you can't you can't hold Congress responsible for lying to your base. They have immunity. You know? Yeah, exactly. And that's that's so much BS. It's unbelievable. Yep. And you know, supposedly you cannot hold a, a governor or a, a mayor responsible for for letting somebody out of jail like that. Uh, what, what was the this? Um, what was the uh, the young lady out in California who was shot by the uh, illegal alien? Yeah, yeah, so, on the pier, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's one, you know, and uh, the family tried to sue the politicians for passing that law in the city, and, of course, they, they came up, they said they had immunity. It's like, oh, my God. Everybody has immunity except the, the, the regular citizens. San Francisco went out of its way to protect the illegal alien. You know, and I, 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 I'm, I'm Mexican. My my pa- my grandparents immigrated to the U.S. in in in, in 1919, 1920. Okay, they followed the law in place at that time, you know. And I don't have a problem saying, hey, you know what? Aliens that want to immigrate right into the U.S. need to follow the law. And if you come here illegally, then then you should be kicked back. Yep. Okay. I, and I've lived overseas uh, many, many, many years uh, in Europe and the Middle East. If you violate their immigration laws, that is sacrosanct, you know. Yeah. It's, you you cannot. If you if, if you overstayed your visa and in, 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 uh, I lived in Spain for several years, if you overstayed your visa in in Spain by one day, you were subject to arrest. Okay, mm-hmm. immediate. You know, if if you were found out, and you went to jail, and if they got around to to hearing your case at any time in the near future, you were lucky. You know, they didn't put a priority on on people violating their their immigration status. You know. I use a, another analogy that you'll probably like just on that. And I'll tell people that are very, oh, they just want a better way for their, for their families and their life. I, I get that, but there's a way to go about it. Exactly. If, if somebody comes onto your property, goes into your house and starts getting food out of your fridge, <laughs> would you be upset? Well, yeah, they, that's illegal. They can't do that. Like, what's the difference? I just exactly. want a better way for my family. I'm hungry. I'm, aren't yeah, I allowed exactly. to what you have? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you what, though. If you did that to politicians, they would howl mm-hmm. all day and all night long. You know, yeah. But as long as it happens to somebody else, they're cool with it. Yeah, the fence okay. is up is around that, Nancy Pelosi's uh, mansion. Is, you know, that, exactly, I mean, exactly. You know what? As, as long as some illegal alien, you know, kills or, or rapes somebody else's daughter, it's okay. You know, that poor illegal alien has a right to be here, you know, because he's, uh, he's oppressed by his country. No, 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 that's not the way it works, my friends. <laughs> you know, absolutely not. You know, and I, I get so angry with uh, our politicians, you know, when, when they do that. Well, with this <laughs> recent pandemic going on and so many people being locked at home and under stay at home orders and their rights and liberties being infringed through a uh, emergency powers to an executive branch in their states. My hope is that when when this gets back to a level of normalcy, which I'm wise enough to know it will never be exactly the same way it was, say, in January of 2020. It's yeah. going to be different. But I hope that people go to the, uh, to the uh, ballot box and remember yes. who it was that limited their rights and liberties and who it was that destroyed their businesses and their livelihood and also all those new gun owners that have joined the fold and have realized that the Second Amendment is for them and they're finally, uh, finally exercising that Second Amendment right, hopefully they'll think of those things when they go to the ballot box this November. Let's just hope that we're all able and allowed to go to the ballot box come November right. election. Right, right. Well, you know what? That's a good point, Clint. We can, we can only hope. But the thing is, you know, I think rational people will remember you know what? I remember, and I'm hoping uh, a lot of my friends, you know, and 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 I guess the center, you know, the the mainstream uh, citizens will remember. Uh, and I'll tell you what, I, I'll never forget Nancy Pelosi, you know, you know, uh, waddling around her kitchen, you know, her five thousand dollar, twenty five thousand dollar refrigerator, eating gourmet ice cream. You know, it's like what? Uh, what was she thinking? You know, it's like totally. Uh, it's like Marie Antoinette. Let him eat cake, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's like my God. Yeah, and and actually comparing Pelosi to Marie Antoinette is very unfair to Marie Antoinette. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. I, 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 I take that back. Good point, Clint. Hey, it's Deb Sullivan from T1 Ammunition. We are the official sponsors of Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Macro. We are also really big supporters of our Second Amendment rights, and we are currently taking orders for ammunition. We have nine millimeter and two two three. 
we are shipping and if you would go to our website www.t1ammo.com you can take a look at the website and you can place your orders there this is meet the pressers with matt mallory and clint macro meet the pressers how can people uh, find your book learn more about you or or see your schedule or, or perhaps attend one of your seminars or, or lectures well, right now with the pandemic, everything's been canceled uh, through the rest of the year. I mean, you know, uh, I, 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 starting in March, I had, uh, uh, I had all, all my all my uh, conferences canceled. Uh, but people can get my book at uh, www.edmorellis.com uh, for autograph copies, and uh, and or they can go to Amazon.com and and look for uh, you know FBI Miami firefight. By the way, as a sidebar, I got a real hoot. Uh, there were, um, because of the uh, anniversary, the, the, the shooting anniversary was this, this month, April, uh, April, April 11th. Uh, and uh, I had uh, an increase in, in uh, book uh, sales. And I, I thought it'd be a real hoot. Uh, I autographed the books, uh, Best Wishes, uh, Ed Morellis, and I, I dated it April 11th. 2020 i thought i thought the uh the buyer would get a hoot out of that you know i That's i thought that was pretty cool you know so cool. <laughs> yeah. that is neat cool well it's been awesome well, having we certainly answer. appreciate having you on the show well guys i really appreciate it you know and uh, uh can you can you can you uh is it possible to cut 20 pounds off my uh, <laughs> my face uh, and because you know video adds pounds you know <laughs> uh yeah I, unfortunately i don't have that technology <laughs> you, you're not a magician right yeah, yeah hey, CN, guys, cnn might have that but i don't <laughs> <laughs> no guys hey it's been a hoot guys it's been super you guys you guys are doing uh, doing the, the real work man you know you're, you're getting the word out there you know as unvarnished and, and, and as straightforward as possible. And I, I, I really appreciate getting the invite. Really appreciate you coming on, brother. Thank you. Okay, my friends. You guys take care. Thanks again. Okay. Well. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. There's a lot of sponsors that make this show possible, like Mantis. Make sure you check them out and give them your business. This episode is brought to you by Mountain Man Medical. The right medical training and gear should be accessible to every American. Mantis. Mantis X helps shooters suck less. Meet the Pressers is sponsored by Next Level Training, Saber Red, Cutting Edge Bullets, the USCCA, ASP, Common Sense Self-Defense, and T1 Ammunition. Meet the Pressers is also generously supported by other fine companies, ranges, and our Patreon members. Thank you. Thanks for watching the show. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share, click the little bell, come on Patreon, help support us that way, come to one of our classes, or host us, we can come to you and do one of our courses at your location. So until next time, adieu. Thank you for watching Meet the Pressers.